study three this morning, Lamentations, the meaning of suffering, and tonight's or today's subject, the man hath seen affliction. Brother Nathan. Thanks, Brother Wayne, and good morning, my dear brothers and sisters in our Lord Jesus Christ, and welcome back to Lamentations this morning. Jeremiah's masterpiece on the meaning of suffering, the value of affliction, and this morning we come to the very heart and centre of the book, the verses that we know and love from Lamentations, chapter 3, and the man that has seen affliction, the one who can see through the incomprehensible fog, who can see past the smoking ruins, the destroyed families, the lives torn apart to the reason why. So this morning we hope to go from how could this be to why has this happened? And you remember in our study yesterday that we delved into the hopelessness and the blackness of Lamentations chapters 1 and 2 where the people were floundering around amidst the chaos, trying to make sense of all of this pain. They realized too late that everyone had abandoned them in their hour of need. The Babylonians swept in and the parties, the good times, the friends evaporated, even God had gone. Because with God at the center of their hearts and minds and worship and lives, Judah was the beauty of Israel. God's princess, his wife. But without God at the center, they were just like the Babylonians. Naked, widowed, childless, humiliated, and broken. And yet we saw towards the end of chapter 2, inklings of hope. You will remember chapter 2 verse 13. For thy breach is great like the sea. Who can heal thee? We have the very first hint that God could heal this awful emptiness. That he could be not just the cause of the problem, but the solution as well. He could heal the bruise, the grievous wound in their souls. If only as we read in verse 19, they could lift up their hands towards him. And it is out of this overwhelming blackness, this foggy despair, the desolation of chapters 1 and 2, with just a stirring of hope on the horizon that the man of chapter 3 emerges, a survivor, to answer their questions and to tell them in chapter 3 and verse 41 that we need to not just lift up our hands towards him, as chapter 2 and verse 19 had said, but our hearts as well. The solution is going to need not just our words, but our hearts but God has promised to heal those as well if we turn to him. And so now this morning, as we come to the man that has seen affliction, Jeremiah is going to lay aside his narrator's quill and he's going to sit down to write a personal soliloquy of sorrow, an introspective, pathos-filled chapter that describes his own position of loneliness and suffering amidst the devastation. Now, we don't have time this morning to go through how Jeremiah is a type of Christ and how Lamentations points forward to Christ, but I have two handouts out the front, uh, up the front here, so feel free to avail yourselves of those um, at the end, uh, and in your own time, you can uh, examine those. But clearly... Jeremiah, and especially chapter 3, is going to greatly typify the work of Messiah, our Lord Jesus Christ. And the first point that he wants to make in chapter 3 is that he's no different to the rest of the nation. He has seen affliction by the rod of Yahweh's wrath, verse 1. And verses 1 to 20 is really all about how this man has experienced all the heartache and pain of the nation. He was not exempt. He was not aloof. He was not separate from the people. He was not different or protected from the troubles 
by God, this man Jeremiah in the first instance, but clearly Messiah himself in the ultimate sense has experienced all the misery of the nation. The Jerusalem Bible has for verse one, I am the man that is familiar with misery. Look at this. This is a a summary of Lamentations 3 and Lamentations 1 and 2. Because the man of chapter 3 has experienced everything that the nation experienced in chapters 1 and 2. He experienced God's anger. He felt like God was destroying his body and his bones. He felt hedged and devoured round about. He felt like no one was answering. He felt like God was destroying like a marauding animal. He felt desolate. He felt like God was bending his bow and shooting arrows at him. In verse 14, he felt mocked by those around him. He experienced bitterness. He sat in sackcloth and ashes. He felt no rest or peace in his mind. His strength failed. He felt alone. He felt that God had shown no pity. Tears flowed like rivers. He felt swallowed up and the waters covered his head. The experiences of the man of chapter 3 are identical to the experiences of the nation in chapters 1 and 2. And this man is at pains to tell us that he came to share our weakness, that he was not different or detached from the nation. God didn't shelter or protect him especially, insulate him from misery, from misery. He learned obedience, as it says in Hebrews 5 and verse 8, by the things which he suffered. And just as the nation experienced the, the correcting rod, as Isaiah 10 verse 5 puts it, the a Syro-Babylonian rod of mine anger, so Christ would experience chastening and suffering. He would be acquainted with grief and sorrow. He was a representative of the human race. This man can only lend us his strength because he first came and shared our weakness. He identifies in every way with all of our pain. There's nothing that Christ experienced, brothers and sisters, that is beyond our experience, or nothing we've experienced that he has not. He was with the nation in all of their heartache. Do you know, that's an an amazing thought, isn't it? If you think, just for a moment, that maybe, just maybe, the book of Jeremiah, which is like a catalogue of Jeremiah's sufferings, was just to establish the credentials of the man who is now going to write this chapter and give us the meaning behind all of the pain. No one could claim that this survivor didn't really understand. He is familiar with misery. Oh, he didn't sin like the rest of the nation. He was not suffering as a punishment for his sins. We read in verse 52 that his enemies chase him without cause. And God himself pleads his cause in verses 58 to 59. He has not abandoned God like the rest of the nation, but he is still touched by the feelings of their infirmities. Here is a man who is just like us. And just to highlight a few aspects of his suffering from the first few verses especially, just look at this man, this man who has seen affliction. Verse 4 tells us, My flesh and my skin has he made old. Literally, it means wasted away or worn out. It's the same word, used of Sarah in Genesis 18 and verse 12 when she was too old to bear children. It's the same word used of the Gibeonites' clothing in Joshua 9 and verse 13. It was fully worn out. This man had aged before his time. He was literally so acquainted with grief that he was physically worn out. As Isaiah 52 and verse 14 says, his visage 
was marred more than any other man. In John chapter 8, they look at him and say, Art thou not yet 50 years old? And he's only 33. This man is worn out by his misery and by his affliction. He's a survivor, but only just. And if there was any doubt that his experiences mirrored the nations, look at verse 7. He has hedged me about that I cannot get out. He has made my chain heavy. And the word chain literally means fetters of brass. It's exactly the same word as 2nd of Kings 25 and verse 7, when Zedekiah and no doubt the other slaves were bound with fetters of brass and marched off as captives into Babylon. This man was no different to the rest of the nation. His fetters of brass, his human nature, were just as heavy, just as painful. He was a man who could represent the nation, for his misery was just the same. Look at verses 10 and 11. He was unto me as a bear lying in wait, and as a lion in secret places. He has turned aside my ways and pulled me in pieces. He has made me desolate. Here's a man who felt like he was being ambushed and mauled by an animal, a wild animal, a lion or a bear. Do you know that God had promised to the nation in Hosea 13 and verses 7 and 8, I will be unto them as a lion. I will meet them as a bear bereaved of her whelps. I will devour them like a lion. And here, this man feels exactly the same. His experience was identical to what God promised the nation would experience in Hosea 13 verses 7 and 8. He's just like them. He's at pains to tell us in the first 20 verses of this chapter, Messiah is... I'm just like the rest of the nation. Look at verses 12 to 13. He hath bent his bow, set me as a mark for, for the arrow. He hath caused the arrows of his quiver to enter into my reins. He felt hunted by God himself. Just as in chapter 2 and in verse 4, God had bent his bow to shoot arrows of displeasure at the nation, now in chapter 3 in verses 12 to 13, he has bent his bow to shoot at this man. In fact, the word mark in verse 12 is usually translated prison. He has set me as a prison for his arrows. None of these arrows are coming out. They're all going to stay in his body like a prison. The arrows enter into his reins. In Psalm 38 verse 2 says, Thine arrows stick fast in me. Thy hand presseth me sore. He feels hunted, persecuted, tormented, smitten of God, afflicted. In fact, this man of Lamentations 3 is none other than the man of Isaiah's suffering servant song in Isaiah 53. And I'd like you to come back there. Isaiah 53. Look at this. There can be no doubt that the man of Lamentations 3, the man who has seen affliction, is exactly the same man as Isaiah 53, who is smitten of God and afflicted. Because when we come to Isaiah 53... Messiah was going to have his visage marred. He was going to age before his time. In Isaiah 53 and verse 2, there was no form or beauty that we should desire him. He was going to be despised and rejected of men. He was going to be a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, stricken, smitten, afflicted, wounded, bruised, depressed, sorry, oppressed, but silent nonetheless. He would be taken from justice, cut off from the land of the living, 
it pleased Yahweh to bruise him. Ah, but there's, a, there's something very interesting in Isaiah 53, isn't there? Because it gets to the nub of what we want to look at this morning. Here's a man who's stricken, smitten, afflicted, yet it pleased Yahweh to bruise him. There was a purpose. There was an objective, a grand reason for all of this misery and suffering. And look what we read in verse 10 of Isaiah 53. Yet it pleased Yahweh to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of Yahweh shall prosper in his hand. He shall see all the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. There was a satisfaction attached to travail. What was that? Was there meaning to all this pain? Is there hope beyond the tears? Maybe, maybe if these men are the same, the same man, he can answer at these questions for us. If Messiah suffered so much, but he emerged satisfied, then maybe he, should, he can share his secrets with us. Because if Lamentations 2 and verse 13 ask the question, thy bruise is great, who can heal thee? Then Isaiah 53 and verse 5 is going to answer that question with his bruises. As it says in the margin, are we healed? Maybe this man has the answers to the questions that we want, that we need, the meaning to suffering. There has to be satisfaction. There has to be something at the end of this hard road. The pleasure of Yahweh would prosper in his hand. And by this man's knowledge, he will teach many of the meaning of suffering. So let us come back now to Lamentations in chapter 3, and for the rest of this morning, we really want to focus in on verses 17 to 40 and look at Jeremiah's inspired perspective on suffering and Messiah's perspective on suffering. Not how could this happen, but why did this happen? The meaning behind the misery. Now, Lamentations 3 and verse 17 concludes the first section of the chapter where, as we have said, this man identifies with the experiences and the horror and the grief of the nation. But look how it ends, verse 17. Thou hast removed my soul far off from peace. I forget prosperity. I forget prosperity. He had forgotten everything that was good, as the word prosperity has in the margin. There was only chaos, privation, and suffering that remained in this man's mind by the time he got to verse 17. Everything good had been forgotten. And you know, it's tempting to feel like this, isn't it, when we are suffering and troubles seem to be overwhelming us. Sometimes, all we can think of is ourselves. Look at verses 18 to 20. And I said, My strength and my hope is perished from Yahweh, remembering my misery, my affliction, the wormwood and the gall. My soul hath them still in remembrance and is humbled in me. When we are overwhelmed, when we're troubled and distraught, we lose perspective. And our world, everything very quickly shrinks down to my affliction, my misery, my wormwood and gall. It's all about me and how I'm suffering and why is this happening to me? And Messiah's answer is that if we are forgetting the good, then remember the good. Recall the good. 
refocus outside of ourselves. Verse 21, as it says in the margin, make our heart return to the good. So if we forget verse 17, then we need to remember verse 19. Have them in remembrance, verse 20. Recall to mind, verse 21. See the point? When trials come in our lives, and how often is this true, sometimes the present just doesn't make sense. And the future seems too distant and intangible. And the only concrete touchstone we have is the past. What God is doing right now seems incomprehensible and the kingdom, the future, just seems too far away. The only thing that is real is what God has already done and this man asks us to remember the past. That's why, brothers and sisters, we have the memorials. On Sunday morning, it's not come and partake of something that looks forward to the kingdom. It's remember what God has already done. And if we were to ask the question, what do we need to remember? What do we need to recall to mind? The answer is verse 22 and 23. God's character. Yahweh's mercy, verse 22. Yahweh's compassion, verse 22. Yahweh's faithfulness, verse 23. Yahweh's goodness, verse 25. And look at the emphasis on the goodness of God's character. If we forget the good, verse 17, what Messiah reminds us of is the goodness of God, verse 25. The goodness of God, verse 26. The goodness of God, verse 27. Remember God's goodness and his character. We can't miss the point, can we? This is a key to overcoming our issues with suffering. We've got to remember God's character. Now, why does Jeremiah focus our minds on this one thing, on God's character? And the answer is that he is drawing inspiration from another man. Another man who was overwhelmed with trouble. And to pull himself out of the blackness, he did exactly that. And that man was David. Now I want you to to draw your attention to one verse that we skipped over earlier And that is verse 6. Verse 6 of Lamentations 3 says, He hath set me in dark places as they that be dead of old. And you may not have realized, but actually the whole of verse 6 is a direct quotation, as the margin says, of eyes of Psalm 143 and verse 3. And Jeremiah is going to lift a verse right out of a psalm of David to explain how he feels. So let's go there to Psalm 143, because embedded in this psalm is the inspiration for Jeremiah's explanation on suffering. Psalm 143. Now, in actual fact, Psalm 143 is connected with Psalm 142. They are, in actual fact, one psalm. We can see that because if you want to put a splash of color, in Psalm 142, verse uh, 3, uh, it says, When my spirit was overwhelmed within me. And when we come to Psalm 143, in verse um, 4, It says, therefore is my spirit overwhelmed within me. So Psalm 142 and Psalm 143 are connected. And it's describing a time why when David feels overwhelmed. 
overwhelmed. The background for this psalm is probably 1st of Samuel 24, when David was desperately running from Saul, hiding in caves, different caves every night, hundreds of men under his control. He's in trouble, fleeing for his life. It was all too difficult. We read in Psalm 142 and verse 4 that refuge failed him. Nobody would offer him comfort. He's depressed, verse 6. He's persecuted. He feels like he's imprisoned, verse 7. And out of this suffering, this blackness that engulfed his soul, we read Psalm 143 and verse 3. For the enemy hath persecuted my soul. He hath smitten my life down to the ground. He hath made me to dwell in darkness as those that have been long dead. So Jeremiah quotes verse 3 in Lamentations 3 and verse 6. Word for word. Clearly, his mind was here. And as it turns out, there are a few allusions in Lamentations 3 to Psalm 142 and 143. Because David here in the psalm felt caught in a snare. In verse 4, refuge or hope had perished from him. He felt imprisoned, as we said in verse 7. He was set in dark places. His heart within him was desolate. He felt like he was one that went, was going down into the dungeon. It was too difficult for David at this time. But then what happens in the psalm is that he starts to become more positive. He starts to say things like, but Yahweh is my portion. He admits in in Psalm 143 in verse 2, for in thy sight shall no man living be justified. He admits that no man living should really receive goodness from God. And finally, he gets to this point where suddenly we read in verse 5, I remember. I remember the days of old. I remember. And if we were to ask, what does David remember? The answer is, when we go through Psalm 142 and 143, is exactly what Jeremiah is going to ask us to remember in Lamentations 3. Read with me, Psalm 143, God's faithfulness, verse 1. God's Loving kindness, verse 8, cause me to hear thy loving kindness in the morning. Where does that phrase come from? In Lamentations, it comes right from here, Psalm 143 and verse 8. Verse 10, lead me into the land of uprightness, for thy spirit is good. Verse 1, he remembers God's righteousness. Verse 11, God's righteousness. Verse 12, his mercy. What does David remember? In Psalm 142 and 143, especially Psalm 143, he recalls to his mind God's good character. So why does Jeremiah quote from this psalm? Because David although physically exhausted and emotionally overwhelmed, was able to drag himself up out of the pit of despair and see meaning behind his suffering, regain a true perspective, restore his mental health because of one thing, his remembrance of the character of God. And Jeremiah, using David for his inspiration, does exactly the same. So come back now to Lamentations in chapter 3 and see why the character of God is so critical to a true and balanced and fair and godly perspective on our suffering. Why does God's good character make sense 
of everything. Well, I think this is what happens when we forget the good. When we forget what is good, as we saw in verse 17, we lose perspective and we start to focus all on ourselves. We have this view that I deserve a good life. And so when we suffer, we often experience three main ways of thinking. The first one is we get angry and we say, Life seems unfair. It's not fair. God is to blame. And we blame God, maybe, uh, maybe uh, overtly or perhaps just in the back of our minds. What else can we do when suffering comes our way? Well, sometimes we get frustrated and we say, it's too hard and I give up. How many times have we seen that when, when suffering comes into the life of a brother or sister and it's just all too difficult to come to the meeting and they lose faith and leave the truth? It's too hard. Right? That's the, the thorns, the difficulties of life. Or we experience doubt and we say, it's all too confusing and I can't seem to see how God cares. And when we're in this situation, we need to remember the good because God's good character puts all of this into the right perspective. So what we want to just do now is run through briefly verses 22 to 39 to establish Jeremiah's perspective and the meaning that we can find in suffering. These are the verses that we know so well from Lamentations, and hopefully now we can see a little more clearly where they sit in the overall flow of the book. The first part of this next section is going to describe what God's character means. If we're to remember God's character, then that means this. And when we come to verses uh, 33 to 39, It will describe the logical implications of our understanding God's character. So this first section that we're going to look at is verses 22 to 32. And then by logical implication, verses 33 to 40. So what's the first thing that we read in verse 22? It is of Yahweh's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. God's character is the touchstone for suffering, for the right perspective, because it never changes. God's character never changes. It's the unchangeable thing in a sea of feelings. God's character is a fact. It's solid and reliable. And and God's character, as described in Ezekiel 34, is overwhelmingly merciful. Overwhelmingly full of goodness merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. And if we were to just pause and think how we would feel if our God described himself as sometimes unfair, often unsympathetic, partially cruel, sometimes heartless, vengeful, callous, indifferent, uncaring, impatient, overly demanding, vindictive. How would we feel about God? We know what his character is. These are the things which are the solid rock in our lives. They might be characteristics, uh, those things like uh, being vengeful or cruel or unsympathetic that we might like to ascribe to God in our difficult moments, but it's not the absolute reality, is it? God is overwhelmingly good. Overwhelmingly good. So that actually, every day, suffering or not, we live by his mercy. We read this in verse 23. His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. When we think God has forgotten us forever, forever, 
we need to be reminded that while we sleep, he is preparing fresh mercy, fresh compassion for us. Psalm 121 verses 3 to 4 says that the God that keeps Israel slumbers not nor sleeps. The whole time that the nation is asleep during the night, he is keeping and guarding their lives. So when everything feels like it's lost, this man puts his trust in God, a God who is preparing fresh energy, fresh strength and breath for him while he is asleep. Verse 24, we read, Yahweh is my portion, saith my soul, therefore will I hope in him. Actually, this is the meaning of Jeremiah's father's name. Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, Yahweh is my portion or inheritance. And all around him, all around him, the nation had lost their portion, had lost their inheritance, their homes, their families, their lives, their possessions. But look at Jeremiah. He's found his inheritance. He's found his possession. And who is it? It's God himself. What a remarkable difference in perspective. Verses 25 to 26 tells us that even when we might not understand or we might not see the big picture, that there is goodness attached to waiting, to developing patience. God's timetable may require our patience It's all, it's not all about us. It's all about actually waiting for him, his timing, his plan. Isaiah 25 and verse 9 says, it shall be said in that day, lo, this is our God. We have waited for him. We have waited for him. He will save us. So suffering is not about us. It's about waiting for God's timing, for his plan. And the sooner in life, verse 27, we realize this, the better. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. The sooner in life we realize that we need to wait for God's solution, his salvation, then the less of our lives we will waste, futilely chasing our own solution. The yoke can't be grievous. It can't be heavy if it's God's salvation. That's what the verse is saying. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden, it's light. Here was a man who understood that yoking ourselves to God's way, to his character, to his salvation, will only make our lives easier. That a burden shared with him is much more than a burden halved. And God's character has the ability to change how we think about suffering. Because it's it's not about us. It's about him and his character being developed in us. Look at verse 28. Once this character is recalled to mind, do you know what its effect is in our lives? Our mouths close. We stop complaining. We stop murmuring. We stop whinging and moaning about how tough this is for me and we quietly wait, verse 26. We keep silence, verse 28. We put our mouths in the dust, verse 29. And verse 29 is the point we all must come to when we consider our own foolishness and our Heavenly Father's ever-patient compassion. We put our mouth, our words our complaints in the dust, his mercies and his compassions and his righteousness humble and silence us. This man in verse 29 is so obedient that he will bear whatever God chooses to put upon him without complaint because he knows that it is only of Yahweh's mercies that we even draw breath. He'll take whatever punishment, whatever suffering, Whatever persecution God's gracious uh, ways will think necessary. Look at verse 30. 
He giveth his cheek to him that smiteth him. He's filled with reproach. He's a man who's not seeking to avoid more suffering. He is a man who's happy to accept what an absolutely righteous God will bring upon him. What an amazing perspective. And he does all of this because of verse 31 to 32, the very heart and soul of the whole book of Lamentations. It's because he knows from God's character that Yahweh will not cast off forever. But though he cause grief, yet will he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. Suffering is God's opportunity to show mercy, to show compassion, to reveal himself. It's not forever. It, all, it will always come to an end. It's God's way of showing himself. Do you know Young's literal translation says for verse 32, for though he afflicted, yet he hath pitied. And this is the answer to one of, we saw yesterday, the themes of hopelessness from chapter 2. Remember we read in chapter 2 in verse 2, and he hath not pitied. Verse 17, and he hath not pitied. Verse 21, and there is no pity. And here we have the answer. God didn't pity? Well, actually he does. He does pity. He has to. It's his character to be plenteous in mercy. And so hidden away here in the heart of the book of Lamentations is the reason for the atonement. God causes grief so that he might show compassion. The reason suffering comes, brothers and sisters, in our lives is so that we can see the richness of God's character, so God can reveal himself to us. This is all the power of God's character to change our perspective. And this whole section begins in verse 22 with mercy, And it ends in verse 32 with mercy. Mercy book ends this little section. This is all about the vital importance of remembering, bringing to mind the amazing character of our Heavenly Father. Now, there are a whole raft of implications that logically flow from a consideration of God's character. And that's verses 33 to 39. Because by logical implication, when we come to verse 33, we read this. Because of God's character, he does not afflict willingly nor grieve the children of men. God never sends suffering without an excellent reason. Chastening is necessary, but it does not give God pleasure. He doesn't send suffering, as the margin says, from his heart. He's not vindictive or cruel. There is always an excellent reason, although we may not know why. In verse 34, we read that it's not to crush under his feet all the prisoners of the earth. God always provides an escape so that we are not crushed. God might bruise but he will never crush us. Crushing is for the seed of the serpent. There will always be a way of escape. Even our Lord Jesus Christ, or of Christ, it is said, a bruised reed will he not break. It's God's design that we are bruised, but never broken, never crushed. In verses 35 to 36, we find that God is not and cannot be unfair, verse 35, or misleading, verse 36. God will not turn aside the right of a man before the face of the Most High, or he will not mislead or subvert a man in his cause. For this Yahweh approveth not, 
by virtue of his perfect character, it would be impossible for God to be unfair or to be deliberately misleading. Verse 36. Verse 37 is going to tell us that he controls everything. And to question his judgment is to doubt his promises, his word, his power, and his character. Who is he that saith, and it cometh to pass, when Yahweh commandeth it not? If God is watching the sparrows, brothers and sisters, and controlling the destiny of the nations, then verse 37 is saying that there is no such thing as good luck or bad luck in the lives of his saints. Nothing happens without his approval and control. And so to question our suffering is either to say that God is not in control or, perhaps worse, that God is doing a lousy job because I think I deserve better treatment. He doesn't understand all the facts. His omnipotent wisdom is questionable. He has dubious judgment about what is best for me. That's really what we're saying when we question God. The RSV has, who has commanded it and it came to pass unless the Lord hath ordained it. We're not in a position, are we, brothers and sisters, to question God's ways. He's never made a mistake. Amos 3 in verse 6 says, Shall there be evil in the city, and Yahweh hath not done it? Who are we to question him? Who are we to question his chastening hand, the pressure of the potter's hands on the clay? Do you know when Job... The example James uses of a righteous sufferer lost everything. It says, he sinned not, nor charged God with folly. Job 1 verse 22, he understood who was in control. He might not have understood why. He might have been greatly hurt, greatly suffering, but he never ever charged God with folly. He never ever said, that God's judgment was dubious or he wasn't in control or he could have done a better job. And so now in verse 39, this section is going to come to a climax where it says, Wherefore doth a living man complain, a man for the punishment of his sins? In fact, so lowly is our status compared to him and his power that if we are alive and the wages of sin is death, then we have not been rightly reimbursed. If God is unfair, it's because he errs on the side of mercy, not judgment. What an amazing perspective. You think about our sufferings every day to think, well, if God was making a mistake, it's the mistake really is keeping us alive because that's something we definitely don't deserve. We need to be grateful. We need to be to, to put aside our complaints, put our mouth in the dust. We are nothing without him. So far from complaining about our suffering, we need to be grateful that God isn't giving us what we deserve. This is quite a different perspective. I'm not saying it's easy, but I'm saying it's quite a different perspective, isn't it? That Jeremiah and Messiah gives us. So look how Jeremiah answers our original problems with God when we lose perspective, when we forget the good. What about this problem of anger when we say, it's all unfair and God is to blame? Lamentations is going to tell us if God was to be fair, we would be dead verse 22 and verse 39 and God's ways and his goodness are not to be questioned verses 37 to 38 God never makes mistakes it's not unfair we can't get angry with God's decisions what if we experience frustration we say it's too hard we want to give up Lamentations 3 says Suffering is only for a time. 
and it's so that God can show compassion. And do you know what? All we need to do is just last one day because his compassions are new every morning. Verse 23. We don't need to overcome suffering for the rest of our lives today. We just need to overcome it today to just get through one day at a time. And what about doubt when we say it's confusing? God doesn't care. Lamentations says God's ways might not make sense at the time, but God does care, and because of his character, he cannot afflict willingly or without purpose. It's impossible for him to do such a thing. To have a righteous character like that, it's impossible. So this is Lamentation's answers, Jeremiah's answers, under inspiration, to the three main ways of thinking that we have when we experience suffering. Anger, frustration, and doubt. So if we were to put this another way and ask the question, why do we suffer? Then this is what Lamentations says. Is it because God doesn't care? Verse 32. And the answer is no. Is it because God gets pleasure from seeing us suffer. And the answer from verse 33 is no. Is it because God wants to crush us? Verse 34. And the answer is no. Is it because God wants to confuse us? The answer from verse 35 to 36 is no. Is it because, well, it's just a result of time and chance? Verse 37. The answer is no. No. Why do we suffer? We suffer because our characters need to be changed, verse 26, so that God can reveal himself, verse 32, and to give us a chance to turn, verse 40. And when you think about it, all of these bottom three answers are really all about perfecting our characters. We have to change from selfish, impatient, self-reliant, deluded sinners to selfless, patient, trusting, faithful saints. And suffering is God's means of achieving this transformation. How else would we become humble or patient or trusting or obedient unless we had to experience difficult times where we were put under pressure and we learnt patience or trust or humility. We suffer because, because God desperately wants us to be like him, to be like his son, and he won't give up. He won't give up on us. We are being conformed, as Romans 8 verse 29 says, conformed by pressure to the image of his son. He wants his character to be our character, And do you know what? It's hard work. It doesn't happen easy. There's a lot of pressure that's needed. And finally, we are conformed into that beautiful vessel that he desires. Look at the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. We won't go there, but you'll remember the words from Hebrews 5. Yet though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. You know, we don't often think about this, do we? Why did Christ suffer? Why did Christ suffer? It certainly wasn't for the reason of verse 39, a man is suffering as a punishment for his sins because he was sinless. So what was he learning? Obedience. Hebrews 5 Verse 9 goes on to say, And being made perfect. Our Lord was not born perfect. He was made perfect by suffering. And that suffering developed character. Unlike us, he never sinned in the process. But it was a learning process. As he fully grasped and reflected from a young boy into a man, the character of his father. In fact, the diaglot has in Hebrews 5, it doesn't say, yet though he were a son, it says, 
because he was a son. That's why he needed to suffer, because that was the teaching ground by which he might absorb the character of his heavenly father. So why do we think it will be different for any of us? If Christ was sinless, and he still had to suffer to perfect his character, to be conformed to his father's image, why do we think it will be any different in our lives? Why do we have this view that we'll be like, we'll be, we, won't, we won't have to go through suffering? That'll be something that we get to avoid because we're more faithful than the people in the world. No, God will always bring it into our lives, in all of our lives, because he wants to develop his character in us. And in actual fact, when we read John chapter 15, what does he do to the, to the, the tree that brings forth fruit? He prunes it even more that it might bring forth more fruit. Perhaps the more godly we live, the more we absorb God's character, the more suffering we can expect because we believe that God is working in us. Suffering is essential. It's the door through which we enter the kingdom. We know these quotations. We must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. For verily when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. The reason why we suffer is so that Christ will be formed in us. It's not an optional process. It's God's method of achieving a family likeness. But look at this perspective now. We can count it as a blessing because it proves to us that God is conforming us. He is in our lives. He does care. He loves us. And therefore, as Hebrews 13 and verse 6 says, he chastens every son or daughter he receives. Suffering makes us legitimate members of his family. What an honor. What an honor to be a legitimate son or daughter of the living God. This is not affliction without purpose or misery without meaning. This is an essential part of our discipleship. And the true disciple can see God's mercies everywhere, even in their suffering. So now we can see how if we forget the good and we lose perspective and we focus selfishly on ourselves, how far off beam we can be. We have this view that we deserve a good life and therefore suffering is God's fault. Suffering is God's blessing to lead us to the glaring word in Lamentations 3 that we have not mentioned yet. Why do we suffer? And the answer is, that all of these bottom three reasons lead us to hope. God doesn't bring misery, brothers and sisters. He offers hope. There's a vast difference in those two perspectives. The purpose of suffering. Look at this, Romans chapter 5. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience and experience hope. The purpose of tribulation is to lead us to hope. And look at Lamentations chapter 3, because the word hope occurs five times in the chapter, and they're all tightly clustered around the remembrance of God's character. Verses 18 to 29 is the progression of hope, and it begins with the mention of of Yahweh's name for the first time in the chapter. In Lamentations 3 and verse 18, we read, My hope is perished from Yahweh. Jeremiah's hope seems to be dead. But when we come forwards to verse 21, we read, This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. Hope glimmers as a possibility. In verse 24, Yahweh is my portion, therefore I will hope. Hope is a gift that comes fresh 
every morning. Verse 26, it is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait. Hope is a profitable and good thing. And finally, by the time we come to verse 29, if so be there may be hope, the man realizes that hope is all he's got. There's a progression of hope in this story. The dawning realization that hope is where God is driving him to. At first it seems dead. Then our perspective changes with the focus on God's character rather than on our own misery. And we realize that hope is all we have. And this man, who had seen affliction, understood the vast difference Suffering is not the indiscriminate cruelty of an unloving God, but the careful alignment of consequences for our own sins that we might desperately grasp hold of his hope. Lamentations 3 is a a picture of a man whose suffering, whose affliction led him to God. It brought him closer to God. And in Lamentations 3, he shares his secrets his experience, his perspective. Verse 26 says, it is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for, what does it say? Yahoshua. Suffering is to teach us that as desperately bruised and wounded by sin as we are, we need to wait for Yahweh's salvation, Jesus, the salvation of Yah, because you see, brothers and sisters, as we conclude this morning, on the road of life, we are all attacked by sin and left for dead. Our hope is perished. We don't have time to look at this in any detail, but I believe that, at least partially, Christ gets his inspiration for the parable of the Good Samaritan from the story of Lamentations. The man who was from Jerusalem, who was wounded and left for dead, beaten up by enemies and thieves. People pass by on the other side. Then someone sympathizes, shows compassion and mercy, and redeems his life. It all comes out of lamentations. Christ's inspiration for this little story. He is able to heal us. His example can save us. He's the good Samaritan who binds up our wounds and redeems our lives. And Lamentations chapter 3 is his secret to understanding the meaning of suffering. He's familiar with misery himself in every form and in every way, but he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. He forgot himself. He put his own mouth in the dust He emptied himself, but he remembered God's character, his compassions every morning, and each day he grew more and more like him, made perfect by weakness. Let's follow him, brothers and sisters. Let's put our mouths in the dust. Let's thank God that his compassions fail not and spend each day hoping that he will come And when the salvation of Yahweh does come, that he might recognize us, beaten and bruised by sin as we are, as those who have been conformed to be like him. People who have allowed his healing hands to bind up their wounds. People who have allowed his perspective to change their lives. Let's, in the words of Lamentations 3 in verse 40, search and try our ways. Turn again to Yahweh and with gratefulness lift up our heart with our hands to our Father in the heavens.